Welcome to the best of the day at ESMO 2014 in Madrid, Spain. European Society of Medical Oncology. My name is Axel Grothy. I'm a medical oncologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We're talking about lung cancer today, and here with me is Dr. Grinden, who's the co-director of the section of medical oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. Great to be here, Axel. Great to have you here. Lung cancer, important, interesting topic. You know, as a GI oncologist, I envy the molecular advances you've made in, in the understanding of disease patterns and treatment options in lung cancer. Radiant One is one of those trials where we kind of try to have a, a more specific adjuvant therapy for patients with early stage lung cancer. There are some updates on Radiant One here. Can you explain Radiant? Absolutely, Axel. As you know, Radiant is a phase three prospective randomized study that is conducted throughout the world where patients actually, I should say global study, and these patients with resected stage one to three non-small cell lung cancer got randomized to a lotinib or placebo following standard therapy. And to get into the study, you have to have, of course, a complete operation, but also have to have an EGF or positive by immunohistochemistry or by FISH test. So not the mutation? Not the mutation. Okay. And that is the big, you caught on to that right away. So that is a problem there. And as you know very well, the results were presented. The primary endpoint was not met. So in other words, use of erlotinib following surgical resection in patients with stage 1 to 3 non-small cell lung cancer is not a standard of care by the way the patients were selected, EGFR positive by immunostochemistry or FISH. So did they have enough power to go back and look at each of some mutated tumors and then see whether those patients might benefit? Not really. You know, there were only about 16 or 17 percent of patients had EGFR mutant disease. So, so this is not adequately powered to ask, in my opinion, the most important question of all, do these drugs, the EGFR TK inhibitors, I'm including all of them, and in fact, the gefitinib, erlotinib, now we have fatinib, and we may have three more uh, coming up. And do these drugs have an effect in improving overall survival in EGFR mutant patients? It's a large open question. Are there studies going to be run? Yes, this is actually right now? the Alchemist study, which just was opened recently, which is a prospective randomized study, which will screen about 8,000 patients. The idea of this trial is very simple. We're going to be looking for not only EGFR mutation, but also for ALK rearrangement. And if they have one of those molecular markers positive, following complete resection and completion of standard therapy, post-operative therapy, whether it's chemo, or radiation, or observation, then they get randomized to the appropriate molecular target therapy. EGFR mutant patients will get erlotinib or placebo. ALK-positive patients will get crisotinib or placebo. But the most important thing of this study, apart from the therapeutic part, is we hope to understand the genomics or alterations in the lung cancer by using these specimens, using large-scale genomic studies. Uh, you are so far advanced uh, ahead of us in compared to colorectal cancer. We hope to get there at some point. But you're leading the way, which is Thank you for saying a, that. In a disease with a high lime need. So EGF receptor mutations. Um, you said 16, 17 percent in our population here. I saw an, an abstract here, and actually an oral presentation from Asia, you know, having a much higher prevalence of EGF receptor mutations. And it tied to a good prognosis. Is this kind of clear set, and is this what we understand? Sure. Mutations have good prognosis, or so that's a great question. So in, in the in the Western population, the prevalence of EGFR mutation among the in the tumor tissues among lung cancer patients is around 10 to 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent. In the Radian study, it was about 16 percent. In Asian uh, studies, the numbers have been as high as 40 to 55 percent, depending on the region. The Pacific Rim obviously has, those countries have a higher prevalence of EGFR mutations among those population. That's an interesting thing. Why do we have a higher proportion in the Asian population? I was about to ask you that. It's, there is one simple explanation. The proportion of never smokers is a bit higher from the Asian studies. As you know very well, the EGFR mutation is much higher than non-smokers. You know, if you take a group of never smokers with lung cancer, anywhere from anywhere from 30 to 60 percent may have EGFR mutation in the tumor tissues. The other issue is that is there a higher predilection of EGFR mutant lung cancer among the Asians across the board? 
Why does it happen more commonly in women? You know, again, there is this Correct. big, yeah. big uh, gender difference there, and that gender difference is not seen with ALK or BRAF or other mutations. So we don't really fully understand the genetic basis of it. Are there some polymorphisms or some germline variants that eventually predispose these patients to get this, or that acts on a background genetic susceptibility? We don't know that yet. And in most of our um, genomic studies, we have been focusing a lot on the acquired somatic changes in the tumor tissues, and I really think we should be looking at some germline uh, changes as well over time. I think that's a very interesting part of genomic research, mm -hmm. you know, for the future. Now, another hot topic right now, cross-oncology, is immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see data on immunotherapy in a palliative setting. We see adjuvant melanoma data, which are interesting, um, and MAGE, a1, A3 was actually one of those agents mm -hmm. which were, as immunotherapy, investigated mm -hmm. in, in early stage lung cancer with a huge effort. More mm -hmm. than 10,000 patients screened for major, you know, if, if to be included, 4,000 patients with major express, uh, expression, then uh, 2,200 patients enrolled in the study, and the study was negative. What happened? Absolutely. I'm actually very impressed with how well you're briefed on this as a colorectal uh, <laughs> specialist. I'm very, I do my very homework. Impressed. <laughs> You've done a fantastic job. So this is actually a massive effort to go after this MAGE A3, overexpressing about 30% of lung cancer patients. And I have to really commend uh, GSK for doing a large study of over 14,000 patients. They had to screen to get those 2,000 patients. And uh, it is truly the largest effort in the early stage of lung cancer. Hopefully we can learn a lot more from the tissues from the study. But sadly, this intervention, given in the adjuvant setting, has turned out to be not a useful thing. In fact, the uh, outcomes were not different between those who got the vaccine compared to the placebo. Ironically, or sadly, I should say, uh, there was some indication that perhaps some gene expression signature may predict for those who may respond well in some earlier preliminary studies, and that didn't really pan out in the final study. So overall, this is a clear negative study. But all is not doom and doom in immunotherapy and lung cancer. I mean, you at least have some data with PD-1, PDL one antibodies. Um, I think there are about 20, 25% response rates with the PD-1 uh, treatment. Absolutely. And I think uh, we've seen now we have a number of drugs starting either PD-1 or PDL one And, uh, you know, having seen a number of these studies over the past few years, I would say roughly about 20% have a nice response, and some of these responses are very durable. I think that's the interesting part. You know, Absolutely. they're really durable. There might be even some long-term cures. I mean, when do we that talk about cures? That may be too cures? early, yeah. actually, to say yeah, that. I mean, when do we talk about cures I after the effect? I think it's going to be a while before okay. we get there. But uh, without a question, we do see some very interesting, uh, people have made some interesting observations. Even after sto stopping therapy for some reason, there continues to be some response in some patients. Uh, and there is some suggestion, I would say suggestion, although some might say more strongly, that the tumor uh, PDL1 expression may predict for those who would respond well. I have some problems here because even in the PDL1 negative group, there are some responses which we cannot dismiss at all, in some average in 15 to 20 percent. I do think the PDL1 expression perhaps selects a group of patients have, who have a higher response rates. I don't think the story is over yet. And I think we should really look for other markers. And, and one of the important things about lung cancer, especially the tobacco-related lung cancer, is that the mutation burden in uh, tobacco-related lung cancer is much higher, yep. about 10 times more than what we see with acute myeloid leukemia and some other cancers. So when you have more mutations, there are chances that you may have some antigens that can be potentially immunogenic, and when you release the breaks of the immune system, perhaps those things may be amenable to this. An interesting quick note, though, is that so far, we have not seen a big difference between the smoking status and response to these agents. So it, numbers of the you know antigen alterations may matter, but the quality of them also may matter. So yeah. again, you know, we it, cannot go it, by the smoking status yet, but there is an intriguing possibility. It's an interesting uh, point that you brought up in terms of mutations um, low that tumors have, because uh, coming plugging some colorectal cancer data in, the only sure. da only group of patients that we have identified so far where immunotherapy might have a higher chance of benefiting patients with colorectal cancer are the hypermutated, the MSI mm -hmm. high tumors that have thousands and thousands of mutations which make these tumor cells potentially recognizable by mm -hmm. the, the immune system. And we see these large tumors with peritumor lymphatic infiltration, lymphocytic infiltration. So I think this 
some common we have theme. some idea about the immune system mm -hmm. might play a role. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's pretty that needs to be teased out, and I think it will take some years before we figure out how to select patients appropriately. And of course, this is PDL1 is not the only checkpoint. Yeah. Lots of other things will be investigated. In combination of immunotherapy, Absolutely. and then CK active immunotherapy yeah. based yeah. on yeah. vaccines. And perhaps vac exactly vaccines mm -hmm. might come back. You know, Absolutely. You know, have a chance finally. Now, now I think one of the approaches we are pursuing and others are interested too is that you know, do the sequencing, find the real antigenic peptides and then you create t-cell vaccines based on that it's a very tedious effort but i think all these efforts are tedious to begin with and yeah. we can whittle down to something easy. and uh, i think you know we're developing new uh, predictive markers mm -hmm. we're developing new resist criteria we for to accommodate the specifics of immunotherapy mm -hmm. delayed responses etc it's an interesting area and Absolutely. an interesting field mm -hmm. right now so immunotherapy but you know your field shines right now with targeting certain subgroups of patients, mm -hmm. the ALT-positive tumors, the ROS1 tumors, whatever, mm -hmm. with specific intervention. I think this is really, for, for a subgroup of patients, you've really made a difference. Mm -hmm. And here, at, uh, we know crizotinib works well in, in ALT-positive cancers. And here at, uh, at ESMO, we saw electinib. Mm -hmm. What is electinib? So electinib is one of those uh, new generation of ALK inhibitor. Uh, and now we have nearly about eight to 10 ALK inhibitors in development, and in the U.S. we have two drugs approved for use, the crisotinib that you mentioned and then seritinib. Mm -hmm. And um, now electinib is coming behind, and uh, in fact, uh, we already known about this in the previous meetings and other presentations that it is an active agent. In fact, the, the bioequivalent study that was presented at this meeting, essentially looking at the capsule size and the food effect, uh, looking at the efficacy of electinib in patients who are ALK positive lung cancer, and uh, the response rates are very good, 60%. And what is more impressive is in that- pre -treated In pre-treated patients. In crisotinib pre-treated patients. Yeah. And uh, what is more impressive is that we see responses in the brain. So these things cross the blood-brain barrier. And I think uh, these responses seem to be durable in a number of patients. And so if you have ALK positive lung cancer, now we have more than one option. Not to mention the chemotherapy, immunotherapy, et cetera. But we have seritinib, following crisotinib, and we have electinib. So only time would tell what's the right sequence, how to use these agents. Is it better to give crisotinib to begin with and progression on progression, use uh, you know seritinib or electinib, or do this fashion, crisotinib, seritinib, electinib, or just use the agent that produces the best results early on. So all these are the questions that we'll be asking in the yes. coming years. A lot to play with. Mm -hmm. These responses, how fast do they come on? You know, in my own experience, we see those responses within a few weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, you can actually, uh, uh, when, uh, when patients go off on these drugs uh, to go on the second ALK inhibitors, you can see them developing this withdrawal reaction oh. and some symptoms coming back within a few days too. So these results are fairly quick. Well, that's interesting. It's mm -hmm. So it's kind of an early response, probably not as long lasting or? You know, they're not too bad for, you know, the, we see a common theming, this oncogenetic tumors and they have a very nice response and a good number of these patients, two thirds of them or so. And they last months, you know, nine to 10 months before they have progression. And um, so that number may be increasing as we have better kinase inhibitors. Would we ever cure these patients with one drug? I don't think so, yeah. but I, I've learned to say never, n never, you know, I never, never. So it may, poss may be possible. But at the present time, I think we are looking at some nice durable control. I mean, it's when you have a, let's say, genetically more simple tumor, dri having one driver mutation like um, C-Kit in GIST, right. for instance. Um, we know matinib works, and matinib works quite long. When you take it away, even if patients have been free of disease for a long time, the adjunct, they relapse, you know. Okay. So I think it's duration of therapy, it really mm -hmm. matters in these. Yeah. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Obviously. So uh, coming back to the EGF receptor mutations, allotinib, jafitinib, now, afatinib, you know, there was a study mm -hmm. presented, the LUX-8 uh, uh, lung mm -hmm. study, um, phase three com um, mm -hmm. comparator study. Sure. You know, this is actually one of those studies um, looking at the efficacy of these agents in squamous cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Just a bit of a background. And, you know, we don't see EGF4 TK mutations in squamous cell lung cancer. We do occasionally, but they are not the typical sensitive ones. And, um, but mostly they have wild type. And people have observed that some of these patients do benefit, if not from dramatic responses, at least some meaningful stable disease for a number of months. So the question really is, is a fatinib better than a lotinib in these patients? 
And it turns out that a fatinib is better than uh, a lotinib so slightly. You know, this is over s nearly 700 patients. And if you look at the median time to disease progression, it's somewhere between 2.7 versus 1.9, basically half a month at the most. And uh, it does come with a slightly higher toxicity with a fatinib. So you could say that there is a better improvement in progression-free survival with a uh, better progression-free survival with a marginal improvement with a fatinib compared to a lot in squamous cell metastatic disease patients. But then you have to acknowledge very quickly that there are more side effects with the fatinib. So I think it's a bit of a wash. So first of all, the EGFR-TK inhibitors have, in my opinion, a very, very modest effect in squamous cell lung cancer. I personally don't think these data are terribly persuasive for me to use a fatinib in squamous cell patients. Do we ever use it, ever use e drug septa inhibitors? Squamous cell in patients? Squamous cell. Uh, you know, erlotinib has been approved for all yeah. non-small cell lung cancer patients, regardless of the mutation status and second and beyond. And so we do use, and I've anecdotally have seen some patients who have had some nice durable, stable disease for a while, but in general, the, the responses are rare less than 5%, and the duration of responses are very brief, as was seen in the study. Yeah. So I would like to circle back to uh, kind of molecular characterization of tumors, because mm -hmm. you know, I thought there was a very elegant late-breaking abstract, which you actually happen to discuss mm -hmm. uh, today, because mm -hmm. uh, we're really doing this live here, Absolutely. Um, about molecular heterogeneity in one patient. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of data published in New England Journal about two years ago where investigators went in and looked at different locations of tumor samples in one patient mm -hmm. from renal cell cancer, primary tumor, different areas of the primary tumor, metastasis, different metastases, and they compared a mutational frequency and, and actually pattern. And they answered a lot of questions about, you know, what's the kind of uh, trunk mutation, what are the branch mutations, and also a question of, do metastasis metastasize? Because mm -hmm. you know that's something my patient asked me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever metastasis can it spread, you know, and yes, based on this phylogenetic mm -hmm. pattern, mm -hmm. we know that metastasis can metastasize. So they did very similar things in, in sure. lung cancer. You know, uh, this is a topic very dear to me because I do research on genomics of cancer. And until recently, we have actually looked at one biopsy from tumor samples, and we have done this massive characterization of the exome, the whole coding regions transcriptome, and some of us have done our own studies with the whole genome where we look at both coding and non-coding regions. The bottom line is in squamous cell lung cancer, we do find about, uh, we do find targetable alterations in about two-thirds of the patients, adenocarcinoma around 70 percent, 75 percent. But what is not known is how heterogeneous these tumors are. These tumors, you have to remember, have evolved over many, many years, very likely and quite often in relation to carcinogen exposure. So they have this critical mutation that causes the initial event, perhaps, mm -hmm. or the lot of background mutation, a critical event happens, then you have the transformation. And then the cells, you know, grow over time and they acquire additional events, become sometimes genomically unstable, pick up more mutations. So not only there is a significant amount of variations between patients on the mutational profile, but within the patient, there may be big differences between the lung lesion and the liver lesion, but even in the lung lesion, depending on where you sample, you can have different things. And that's what this group actually worked on from UK. And this is the very same group that uh, did this heterogeneity studies in kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. And this is on lung cancer. Basically, they looked at a number of patients who have a small number of patients who looked at, uh, you know, looked at both squamous cell as well as adenocarcinoma. The, the key points are whether you look at the typical mutation, what we call single nucleotide variation, or copy number alterations, or even some structural variations, you see a lot of heterogeneity. And about a third of the alterations or mutations were private in the sense that they are not present in all the regions. And also, you could get an illusion of clonality. If you sample one region, you find a predominant number of mutations, you would think that's called clonal. But if you, if you biopsy some other region, you may find something else, uh, some other area is to be clonal. And what should the practicing oncologist take make of all mm. these things? First of all, I would say the issue of heterogeneity in cancer is, I think, is universal. The, the real question is how significant it is in terms of driver mutations, because a lot of mutations are what are called passenger mutations. They're in for the ride. They don't really play a major role in this or driver mutations present in kind of a focal clones. In other words, if you, if you biopsy one area, you'll get EGFR, another area, you'll get ALK. 
I don't think so at the moment. You know, you may have some driver mutations here and there, but most of the known driver mutations are founder lesions are present in the founder clones. That means every single region will have that, in my opinion. So they're on the trunk, as they... They're what we call, if you imagine a tree, and tree with the trunk, trunk is the founding clone, and then you have the branches going in different directions, subclones. And uh, the many, the other issue, basically all this heterogeneity, they all, you can boil them down into two issues. Do they play a role in metastasis? In other words, subclones, the branches break off and go to a different place, and they may have, the, if, they, if they are more, they are fit to adapt to local, you know, tissue situation, and then they can develop, uh, you know, new clones. You may find alterations that can predict for metastasis. So that research needs to be done. Second is this therapeutic resistance. Over time, after you treat them, you can have new clones emerge and they can contribute to resistance. For that, we have to do thousands of uh, patient analysis similar to what was presented on just yep. less than around 10 patients. So this has to be expanded and there are plans to study that in the coming years. So the bottom line is stay tuned. Stay tuned. So you can, it's in, not feasible to biopsy you know, different areas necessarily. What about this idea of liquid biopsies? Liquid Does biop that play a role here? Absolutely. You know, the liquid biopsies, there is a cell-free DNA looking for plasma. I, I think the technology has to really evolve a little bit more before we can replace completely the invasive biopsies. If you have a set of known variants, we can look for in the, in the circulating thing, but discovering, I think we are getting there, but to discover all, all the new novel variants are in the circulating free DNA, it's possible, but it's gonna be, it's gonna need some more work. But I also think we should use uh, a new setup to look at what we call the warm autopsy, where we can get procured samples from patients who have just expired and do this multi-region analysis to really learn about this. And I think we're gonna be doing that in many places in the coming years. And uh, I think that'll help us a lot more to understand this evolution of the these clones. I mean, the uh, the value we put on getting biospecimen and good biospecimen in patients and the willingness of patients to allow us to take their biospecimen to get biopsies, I think is really what drives the advances right now in, in molecular medicine across two different tumor types. Absolutely. There's a lot to be learned. Absolutely. Anything you want to add again? I mean, no, it's been wonderful Madrid. talking with you and uh, I'm glad uh, I have now, now you can go and start practicing lung cancer. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. So thanks for watching the best of the day from ESMO 2014. My name is Axel Groth. I hope you join us for future programs.